The British suffragettes are now lionized as self-sacrificing activists who won the vote for women. In fact, they probably delayed the granting of woman suffrage with their violence, and they offer a case study in the mass hysteria, longing for martyrdom, and narcissistic indifference to other people that so often characterize dangerous zealots. I'm Janice Fiamengo, and this is the Fiamengo File 2.0. From the time of its founding in 1903 until 1914, the Women's Social and Political Union, the radical arm of the early 20th century British feminist movement, became an increasingly violent organization that distinguished itself from other women's groups of the time by living up to its ominous motto, Deeds, Not Words. Though now largely remembered for innocuous deeds such as hunger strikes in prison, members of the WSPU were in reality responsible for a bombing and arson campaign that brought enormous destruction and terror across the British Isles and involved hundreds of militants. The fact that these women, dubbed suffragettes, believed they could get away with their violence and that they did get away with it in that they are now widely regarded as victim heroines offers shocking proof of the power of feminist ideology then and now. The charismatic leader of the suffragettes was Emmeline Pankhurst, a comfortably middle-class widow of a radical lawyer who had grown tired of the slow pace of democratic reform in her homeland. It was irrelevant to Pankhurst that British political culture was undergoing massive democratization and that getting a bill for woman suffrage passed through Parliament was a complicated process. It was irrelevant to her that most working-class men in her country still lacked the right to vote. She wasn't interested in working-class voting rights at all. Moreover, she was indifferent to the pressing issues facing the British government in the early years of the 20th century, issues that included the threat of civil war in Ireland over Irish independence, colonial rebellion in India, and deep discontent among the working poor. Pankhurst's sense of the injustice she was suffering dwarfed all, and under her command, the Women's Social and Political Union went from heckling politicians and smashing shop windows to the far more belligerent techniques of guerrilla warfare that accelerated in the years leading up to the First World War. Pankhurst and her fanatical followers were so convinced of the righteousness of their cause and so confident that whatever occurred they could portray themselves as valiant victims that they seemed to have cared nothing about the costs of their incendiary crusade, which included ruinous attacks on centuries-old churches and other priceless historical buildings, as well as on countless small businesses and shops, and led to serious personal injuries to the mostly working-class men who became their collateral damage. A full history of the suffragettes cannot be offered here. For a detailed overview of suffragette terrorism, see Simon Webb's book, The Suffragette Bombers, from which I draw heavily, and William Collins' video series, Centuries of Oppression. One of the first of the suffragettes' militant strategies was setting fire to letterboxes and postal outlets. In theory, this sounds fairly harmless. As Simon Webb demonstrates, however, it was both a politically useless and dangerous method of attracting attention. Suffragettes employed a concoction of phosphorus and sulfuric acid, which when poured into postal boxes adhered to letters and later interacted with the air to create combustion. Many packages and letters in the process of being poured out of bags for sorting in postal offices suddenly burst into flame. 
These fires became common in the years 1912 to 1914 and caused painful burns to the hands of postal workers, threatening them with permanent lung damage from the phosphorus. One mailbag on a train compartment exploded with such intensity that the train car began to burn and a postal worker sustained severe injuries throwing the burning letter bags out of the railway compartment. Suffragettes also chose far more spectacular targets, burning many large country homes across England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. One such target was a house being built for Member of Parliament David Lloyd George in South East England. Just before the workmen were to arrive one morning in February of 1913, a bomb brought down the ceilings and blew out the windows. Many country homes were completely destroyed by suffragette fires. Other high-profile targets from 1912 to 1914 included the Bank of England, St. Catherine's Church in London, St. Mary's Church in Whitekirk, Scotland, Britannia Pier in Yarmouth, Aberchill Castle in Scotland, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, Westminster Abbey and Rosslyn Chapel. Suffragettes also chose more practical and strategic targets, including railway stations, canals, greenhouses, aqueducts, dockyards, military barracks, refreshment buildings, bridges, golf course and lawn bowling pavilions, sports facilities, and hotels, to name only the most common. For well over two years, the bombings and arson attacks were near constant. Historians and commentators, almost all of them sympathetic to the suffragettes, tend to gloss over this violence or omit it from their accounts altogether. Feminist professor of English Jane Marcus makes not one mention of bombs in her introduction to a book titled Suffrage and the Pankhurst, which glorifies Emmeline and her daughter Christabel and tells readers that, quote, the real key to the genius of militant suffrage, end quote, was the feminist practice of interrupting male politicians' speeches, which Marcus claims was a revolutionary feminist technique by which each woman learned, quote, not only to speak in her own voice for her own cause, but to split asunder patriarchal cultural hegemony by interrupting men's discourse with each other, end quote. An uninformed reader would come away from Marcus's commentary believing that the suffragettes gained their notoriety entirely through verbal confrontations and self-sacrifice. More responsible commentators can't avoid mentioning the bombs altogether, but emphasize that the suffragettes attacked property rather than people. Damaging and expensive, certainly, in fact, causing damage in the millions of British pounds, but not first-order violence. Simon Webb points out the dishonesty of such a characterization, noting that if the owners themselves weren't in residence in most of the large country houses that were burned, many domestic staff members were living in the servants' quarters to maintain the properties. Suffragette attacks showed blatant disregard for the lives of these voteless working-class people. Rarely mentioned also, are the countless numbers of these servants, as well as shop owners, their employees, and other workers who were left without any means of earning a living as a result of suffragettes' actions. Direct violence against people was part of the suffragettes' campaign also. In July of 1912, an attack occurred against Prime Minister Herbert Asquith when he was riding in an open carriage through the city of Dublin with Irish Nationalist MP John Redmond to commemorate an Irish Home Rule Bill. As the vehicle made its way through the crowds, a suffragette threw a hatchet at Asquith's face, which missed him and sliced through John Redmond's cheek and ear. On the following day, suffragettes attacked a full theatre, in which Asquith was scheduled to speak, pouring petrol on carpets and curtains and setting them alight, and also detonating several bombs. In 1913, suffragettes attempted to assassinate a magistrate, Henry Curtis Bennett, with a letter bomb, and when that failed, two suffragettes attempted to push him off a cliff. In 
through all of the destruction of property, threat to livelihoods, and physical harm to innocent bystanders, the suffragettes saw themselves as sacrificial heroines. Like many terrorists, they envisioned their cause as pure enough to justify nearly any level of violence and imagined themselves as martyrs acting out of an all-consuming love. One of their main aims, in addition to attracting attention, was to provoke men in particular to commit violence against them so that they could then publicize the violence, believing that as women they were involved in what they had named a sex war. They wanted that war so blatantly manifested as to be undeniable. They wanted to be able to display for all the world their own suffering bodies. And they were able to in various ways. As their bombing campaign continued, the public mood, not surprisingly, turned against the suffragettes, and WSPU meetings began to attract crowds of frustrated opponents. On some occasions, angry crowds seized hold of suffragette speakers, sometimes ejecting them from buildings where they had gathered, at other times pelting speakers with bottles and bricks. In June of 1914, for example, an attempt to hold an outdoor meeting in North London resulted in assaults on the speakers and eggs and flour thrown at those who had gathered to hear them. The suffragettes exulted in the opportunity such violence offered. It proved their point that men were brutes and that only political power could enable women to purify public life and to protect other women. Hunger strikes were another effective propaganda technique. Suffragettes sent to prison for their criminal offenses regularly threatened to starve themselves to death in protest. Emmeline Pankhurst herself boasted in public speeches that authorities couldn't keep her in prison because of her hunger striking. The authorities were caught in the trap created by the suffragettes' victimhood posturing. Terrified by the thought of any suffragette dying in prison, authorities enacted countermeasures such as force feeding or releasing hunger weakened prisoners until they were well and then rearresting them under a law that came to be called the Cat and Mouse Act. Both of these countermeasures were effectively deployed by the suffragettes against the government. In particular, the image of women being held down and forced to accept a feeding tube became a graphic, grisly illustration of feminine vulnerability and sinister state violence. Such images were exploited to the hilt by suffragette campaigners and have lived on in the public memory as emblems of feminist heroism. The most famous suffragette martyr of them all was Emily Davison, a graduate of the University of London and a veteran WSPU terrorist. Her activities didn't stop with hunger striking or postbox fires. She's believed to have been centrally involved in the aforementioned firebombing of the house of politician David Lloyd George, and she was arrested for attacking a Baptist minister at a railway station because she thought he was the hated David Lloyd George. Most famously, she is the woman who was mortally injured as she rushed onto the racetrack at the Epsom Derby in June of 1913 as the racehorses swept by. No one is sure whether Davison was simply intent on a very public and gruesome act of self-destruction or whether she was trying to grab hold of the reins of the king's horse, Anmar, possibly to pin a suffragette flag on those reins. Whatever her reckless motive, she was trampled under the horse, which somersaulted and landed on top of the jockey, Herbert Jones, who himself narrowly escaped being killed. He later committed suicide. The suffragettes turned Davison's funeral parade into a dramatic celebration of her martyrdom, claiming she had been driven to her death by a cruel government. And over the past century, photographic images of the race course spectacle have become iconic of her tragic nobility. In actuality, Emily Davison was a fanatical 
irresponsible and violent person, her willful self-slaughter, and the willingness of other suffragettes to bomb churches and aqueducts, and a credulous public now eager to see them as martyrs, all point to the vicious sentimentality and attention-seeking that were integral to this much-celebrated facet of the feminist movement. Ultimately, the suffragette campaign ended inconclusively with the advent of the First World War, as most suffragettes turned their attention to other propaganda campaigns. Though they were almost certainly responsible for making the suffrage cause less popular and less practical than it would otherwise have been, the suffragettes have been post posthumously sanctified as heroic crusaders for justice. Many of them, in reality, were zealots so obsessed with their own alleged victimhood that they went to war against the working people of their own country and claimed to be doing it for the betterment of the human race. One can hardly imagine a more profound delusion or one more representative of feminist theory and practice.